of getting into law school because of this. I understand why people adhere to PC culture passively, but why, when it is clear it causes direct harm, do people, university staff in my case, still act as though it is the moral high ground? That's from Zach. Wow, Zach, what a uh, what a story. I am uh, I'm I'm ambivalent about hearing it for for reasons we'll we'll get to. But is there anything you wanted to add? I don't mean I don't know if you want to add any details. I don't know if you want to be findable by the details you might add. Uh, but I'm obviously like everyone curious about what happened. Okay, Stefan. Uh, by the way, thank you so much for letting me be on the show. It's a real pleasure. Um, oh man, this is this is what I do. I'm I'm happy to have you here. All right. So I don't know how much detail you'd be wanting or interested in, but I'll give you what I can. Um, so essentially, there was a situation with my fraternity back in January. We have an initiation day uh, for all the new members, and the night before, we have this event we call the challenge. And during that night, um, we could do all sorts of like team building games and you find out who your, your big brother is in your fraternity. If you're not familiar, it's sort of like a mentor personally who's going to help uh, guide you through the fraternity experience. Uh, and after that, we do some ritualistic things. Um, and my contribution to all of this, that there's this time when uh, all of the new guys go away. They actually go, they're blindfolded and they're taking a little car ride while we get the house ready for uh, what's to come. And then they come and they wait in the basement of the house to be taken one by one up where they're going to go through this ritual thing. Right. And while they're waiting down there, we're trying to drive up the, the suspense and the mystery of the whole situation as much as possible. We're giving them random commands. We're, we're playing loud music. We're making random noises, uh, whatever it is. And my contribution to the whole situation um, so to give you a little bit more backstory, our, our university really pushes condoms on everybody. They have this uh, program called the Condom Club. They, they hand them out for free. They give you buckets of them uh, at fr uh, fraternity risk talks, which they mandate. Um, and so what, my joke what, what was – What is a fraternity hey, risk talk? A risk talk is something that the, the university requires, and that, it's actually most universities that have fraternities, where you've got to several times a semester have a, a speaker come in to talk to you about why, uh, you know, basically alcohol awareness, how to tell if someone's had too much, or or um, basically what is rape. And of course, their definition is the uh, my sober yes is my consent, and it gets into all sorts of ambiguous details, but we don't need to go down that rabbit trail. Um, but, but I assume it's the, um, you know, one of the basic problems with that is only the woman's non-consent seems to matter. If the man is drunk, uh, it doesn't seem naturally. to show up, right? Naturally, naturally. Well, I mean, they're more lawsuit focused in all of these risk talks. But anyways, they, they hand these things out like crazy. In our house, we literally have buckets of them. Um, and there was a person, we had a group chat among all the fraternity brothers. There's a, a new member who asked, hey, uh, is there anything we should bring to this event? And I jokingly replied, oh, bring a condom. Well, it turns out some people actually brought them. And then my next thing was at the event, while they're waiting in the basement, people are giving out random commands. There's all sorts of craziness going on. I say, okay, take it out and put it on your right hand. All right? And then I told immediately after that, okay, take it off. It was, it was something just like everything else. It's stupid. It's something a stereotypical frat boy would do or say, but it had Wait, no... So you, the, the, you, you said bring a condom. It's a joke. Mm -hmm. And you said put a condom on your right hand and then take it off. Right. Correct. Exactly. Okay. So now, that is... Obviously, for a man, the right hand can, in fact, be a sexual organ. Not something that really needs a condom, but okay. Uh, so then what happened? Right. So after that, um, there was some other stuff that had gone on as far as um, what the university believed to be hazing, at least. And we had an anonymous report come in that our university or that our fraternity was being charged with hazing or was being uh, accused of hazing. So they took us the the student conduct office, took us one by one, every member of the fraternity into a room, and they called it an informal meeting, but it was more or less a deposition, right? They were they were pressuring you, they were trying to get you to answer questions, trying to get you to admit to things. And so you were, out, you were in a situation of academic jeopardy, but you weren't allowed to know the rules or have a lawyer or a representative, is that right? Well, I, well, I was allowed to have a lawyer present in the room, but not to speak for me. Like if I wanted to whisper in his ear and he wanted to whisper back into mine, that would have been acceptable in their eyes. But if I would have had a lawyer just like in, in a courtroom, uh, representing me, that would not be okay. They wanted to hear directly from me. And for reasons I, I understand that much of it, 
Um, but what ensued was what I think is really uh, draconian. Um, so after after this this whole ordeal, it came out like that I had said those two sentences, right? And then the university became very concerned about all of that. And it turned out we had a a, a hearing. Um, oh, sorry, concerned with, about what? Concerned that I had committed the audacious act of hazing by uttering those two sentences. By saying, put the condom on your hand, take the condom off your hand. Right, right. Uh, that was the only thing. There was no force in this matter. All of the new members had already been voted into the fraternity. There was no, like, oh, if you don't do this, then you won't get into the fraternity sort of vibe going on. It was purely a matter of just the fun and games, the whole thing. And we had explained to them before, like, we don't haze like other fraternities haze. We're not going to put you in a situation where you have to do something stupid in order to get into fraternity. It was common knowledge and it was commonly received by everyone in that situation as a joke. Like no one took it seriously. No one, well, not, no one took it seriously to the point where they thought, okay, if I don't do this. It didn't do anyone any harm, right? Precisely. I mean, it was Precisely. just a goofy thing. Put a condom on your hand and take a condom off your hand. That this, this is the big right. hazing thing. I mean, the I'm hazing gonna... stories that I've heard. <laughs> Yeah, right. Pretty, pretty well, astonishing. When I was younger, I mean, just for those who don't know this little snippet of of my history, uh, I um, uh, I lived in a frat house for a year, and really? uh, yeah, I, I did. Um, when I when I I was working up north doing my sort of gold panning and claim staking and so on, and I got back because it took like four airplanes to get back from the remote location I was in. So I got back to. I got to university a little bit later than everyone else, and the only place that was available was like a room in a frat house. At least it was on campus, and I didn't want to truck in and out. And so um, I stayed with a guy I'm still friends with. We we stayed in the same room for uh, a year, and then we ended up roommating the next year as well because we got along well. And um, yeah, I mean, occasionally I cleared out for frat business. They did actually ask me to join, and they were nice guys, and I really understood the appeal. It wasn't my particular kind of thing, but they were nice guys. Uh, I, I could I could completely see the value of the frat, you know, the the brotherhood, the um, the contacts, the connections, the networking, and that, that sounds kind of cold hearted, like it's just some sort of resume thing, but um, right. they really seemed, you know, dedicated to each other. They did a lot of good charity works, uh, and they were very much involved in the community and so on. And um, yeah, I think that the uh, the hazing rituals such as I heard of could be a little hairy, but um, I don't know. It's just dudes, right? right? So, uh, but this, I don't, you know, it's like, oh, what joke did you make? You know, <laughs> did you burn a cross somewhere? <laughs> like, I mean, it's like, no, just kind of on a hand and off. I mean, no, really, that's so, okay, what happened after that, Zach? It was, it was nothing that would ever be covered under, say, a speech code or anything like that. They covered it under their hazing policy. So we got into this hearing, and the way it works is they had three people from the university lined up to hear all the stories. The thing was 10 hours long. We sat in a room while all of the questions you know, were darted around the room about this incident. There were other contributing factors to, to the reason my fraternity got suspended. Um, I, was, I played a very small role in all of that, I would say. But... This, my questions, like the question about what I had done still came up. And I was informed by a university administrator that under the university's hazing policy, right, they've got this thing about why it's not okay to degrade people in that policy. And then I questioned every single witness they brought in the room. And I asked, did you feel that I degraded you by asking you that question or by telling you that? And not a single person responded that they felt degraded. Well, so at the very end earth, of it, Sorry to interrupt. Do you know how on earth the... Gestapo administration even found out about this stuff? Yes, yes. Um, it was one of the new members. Um, he, well, to, I don't want to make the story too long here, but one of the other contributing factors to why our fraternity got in trouble were there were some rogue members of the fraternity who wanted to do more of the traditional uh, big party school hazing, and they went out on. A, they went out by themselves, invited some of the new members over to their private house, and did some stuff. And then one of those guys told uh, a residential advisor um, to, and who reported it immediately to the school. And that's how this whole thing uh, came to their attention. Now their attention turned to me because I had the audacity to say uh, those two sentences, and. Um, like I said, their definition of degrade came up. Their definition of degrade, I'm not going to quote it word for word because I don't know it word for word because it's not written anywhere that I could find. But their definition of degrade, as I remember it, was to treat another 
students with less respect than they deserve. And I've never heard more of a non-definition than that. Wow. Well, of course, you know, totalitarians don't want any objective rules. You know, if, if you want to know what a society of the future would look like if the left wins, just think of the left or the social justice warriors being the founding fathers and what kind of society you would have ended up with in that situation. So probably not one we would remember today. Uh, we might remember it, but not in a positive way. True, true. Yeah. So Oh, that's, it's like the family court definition of in the best interest of the child. Yeah, right. right. You know what's and in the best interest of the child? Not having crappy government schools and a huge giant national debt that they did nothing to deserve. But that doesn't matter now, <laughs> does it? Yeah, of course not. All right. So then? So then after this, um, uh, I'll give you one more piece of the story. I don't want to make it too long, like I said. Um, so in this whole process, my fraternity brothers, I, I, I don't want to use this term because I don't like it, but they, they cucked out. They completely bowed their knees to the awesome might of the university administrator. Um, and they almost immediately, as soon as the charges came out, uh, voted me out of the fraternity and voted to expel me from the fraternity, not because of, of moral reasons, but because they thought they had a better chance of staying on campus if they could show the university that they had handled, handled this horrendous situation internally. So yeah, they, they were hoping that if they betrayed one of their own, that the social justice warriors would be appeased and would not escalate. Precisely. Yeah, precisely. because appeasement always works that way. And personally, I don't really, I don't hate any of them for it. I think they had a gun to their head. I think they made the wrong decision. But it is what it is. The real culprit in this case is the university. So after the hearing, uh, I was given a chance to appeal, and I appealed. I, I scoured their own uh, policies. I'm sorry, and you, you said the the charges and the hearing, but what was the outcome? What would you have been appealing? What was the verdict? Right. Okay. So they voted to suspend me for one year, and that would that almost that immediately resulted in the loss of a full ride scholarship with uh, money that I actually was going to be able to use for grad school as well, and a smaller supplementary scholarship, and. I don't want to brag on myself here, but I was I was one of their ideal students. We have this thing called Top 100 on our campus. I was nominated for it. it it's this – I've been making the dean's list. I've been academically strong, involved in all sorts of student organizations, community service, all of the above. Yes, but, but that has nothing to do with it, Zach. The reality is that the existing culture doesn't want – white males to have any brotherhood, does, doesn't want them to have any contact with each other, doesn't want to have them uh, any support structure, uh, doesn't want to have uh, any networking. I mean, this anti-white male hatred is uh, running so deep that it's becoming catastrophic. So uh, this is why fraternities uh, are attacked, because they're considered to be, you know, preppy white uh, boy uh, clubs. Uh, and this, you know, as we all know, community gives people strength. Uh, having friends uh, that you're bound to gives people strength. Having networks gives people strength. Having support gives people strength. And that can't be allowed to white males anymore, which is why this stuff gets targeted so much. Right, right. I completely understand and agree with that. Um, so the, the decision that I was appealing was what I said. I was, I was suspended for a year. Um, and I scoured their own policies and procedures and found that they had not only broken their own policies and procedures, but uh, quite possibly federal law as well um, in doing this. Uh, there are several court decisions which say that you must have this hearing in front of a third party, which means not employees of the university. Well, all three people who were voting on what would happen to me or voting on whether or not I did what uh, they accused me of and with what my sanctions were going to be. All three of them were directly employed as staff members by the university. Um, so I appealed on those grounds and I was granted a rehearing, which is actually tomorrow. Oh, wow. Okay. And and do, you have a, do you have a lawyer? Do you have uh, support in that sense? I've reached out to, to quite a few lawyers, the ACLU, uh, all sorts of organizations. Um, I've just hit so many brick walls. I personally don't have the means to afford uh, a big retainer. Um, and a lot of the lawyers I've called who seem to be very much pro free speech guys uh, laugh me off on the phone because, I mean, they're not absolutist to anything to any extent, but they were concerned with the, oh, you might have hurt their feelings, they might countersue sort of arguments. 
Yeah, and the ACLU just do a fairly growing, a glowing portrait of Linda Sarsour. She may they may not they may not be your first choice for this kind of right. stuff. They weren't, believe me. Yeah. How much money do you need? Uh, well, the average trainer fee I've I've been asked for is about five thousand bucks. Five thousand bucks to help you with a hearing about condom use on the hand. Right. We're we're calling the whole situation Condom Gate, by the way, because I think it's a catchy name. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And and uh, so it's tomorrow, and it's tomorrow, right? Correct. Correct. July thirteenth. Um. And what are your hopes for that? Well, if I were to be super optimistic, I'd say that because this time around they're going to have a faculty representative and a student rep representative voting on my decision and not people purely uh, driven by university interests that they might decide what a normal human being would decide in this case, which is that that sort of thing is just guys being guys and not, not horrible behavior. Um, but I do not think that um, this is going to go well, honestly. I was given a personal phone call by, by the dean um, shortly after I appealed, and he basically tried to convince me not to by saying, well, we were lining up the hearing with staff members because students are normally too harsh. I don't know if I buy that because they aren't beholden to university interests. but. I, I, basically, I, I wouldn't give any faith to them being fair the second go around either. They very well might say that they're going to expel me this time around. Right, rather than um, the suspension. Now, after the suspension, would you have any chance to get your scholarship back or is that gone? <laughs> well, I mean, they gave me a chance to appeal the scholarship. That's actually the day after tomorrow is the deadline for that. So I'm going to wait until I hear... Uh, back on what my my sentence is before I go down that road. But if I were suspended for a year, there is no chance, realistically, that I could get that scholarship back. And um, what were you taking, Zach? What was I taking, like, uh, course-wise? Yeah, I mean, what was your major or what was your faculty? Like, so I was a chemistry major um, with the intention of going into law school, uh, pursuing a career in patent law. Right. 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 Well, I'm. I'm shocked that I'm shocked, but I'm shocked. <laughs> right. That is pretty. I mean, that's the most innocuous hazing that I've ever. If it's not even whatever you would qualify it at. I mean, that's put a condom on your hand, take it off. I mean, it's constitutionally protected speech, of and it's it public. Is. Speech. Of course, it is. They shouldn't even be legally allowed to. Like, if I had the resources to pursue uh, a case against them, then I, I'm confident that uh, the outcome would be positive in, in, my, in my favor. But as of right now, with the next semester creeping uh, creeping up, I've got to think of other things. Like, what am I going to do in the immediate future? What am I going to do as far as uh, the next school? I've been accepted into a couple different universities, but I still have to make all these decisions, pay all sorts of fees, and, and figure out the next steps. You know. Why do you want to go back to college? Specifically, uh, my my thoughts on this have always been: don't go to college unless it's a career that you really realistically cannot do without a college degree. Specifically, I would like to go into patent law. Uh, it's a field that's always interested me. Uh, I'm very good at chemistry, and I've got a, a brain that um, I'm, I'm really good at thinking like a lawyer in that sense. Um, and I really don't like the state uh, of the current patent system and pharmaceutical specifically is what I'm interested in, in going into. Um, and I think it would be a career in which I could thrive. I would very much enjoy it. And I could also do much good. Right. Okay. Now, as far as pursuing a suit for, I don't know, like a violation of your First Amendment rights or whatever, I mean, you you could you could crowdfund that I think pretty pretty easily. I mean, lots of people are focusing on this campus stuff. And if you look at if you look at what's happened to some of the universities that the PC culture has metastasized to the point where they're popping up regularly in right. the uh, in the alternative media and even sometimes on the mainstream media. I think you're like University of Mizzou and and people like that. 
um, or, or groups like that, uh, they've had huge declines in enrollment. Like it cost them a massive amount. Right. And there are financial incentives for them to want to keep this quiet. And you could get some, I'm sure you could get some pro bono stuff, you could get some crowdfunding, you know, you could tell your story to campus reform, like if you wanted to take this on. Right. There are ways well, I, I of, uh, of doing it. And that may give you a different mindset tomorrow. Well, the collateral damage from what has happened, I, I've been essentially forced out of my house. I, I lost a lot of friends. I don't know if I'd call them friends in the first place, some of them. Uh, I've lost you know, the scholarships. I've had to focus on you know, what the next steps are as far as new schools or trying to remedy this current situation. It's been almost a full-time job just trying to cut my losses here. So I haven't put a lot of thought into things like uh, um, – like what you're talking about, campus reform, until like I know the conclusion of my story, uh, which I guess I'll know tomorrow. Um, I, I feel like that is should be secondary to these other immediate concerns. Right, right, all right. And how is your family with all of this? My family is outraged that <laughs> there would be anything like that the university would take anything this stupid so seriously. It's anything this petty. Um, they're, they were against me joining a fraternity in the first place. I, I've got some disagreements with, with them on that, but I think their intentions were, uh, were wholesome um, because they were afraid of almost exactly this sort of thing. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this is obviously not even close to the same degree of seriousness. In fact, it's not serious at all, in my opinion. But if you look at uh, how UVA fared with the rolling... Stone story that they got sued for and lost, if I remember rightly. This is the only name dropping I'm going to do. Same fraternity, buddy. Right. Yeah, I mean, it is it is open season on on frats because right. to, you know. I mean, I know that there's lots of multicultural, multiracial frats and so on, but in general, the perception is, I mean, there's this wild hatred for frat boys. Right. And it is, uh, you know, they're a targeted group these days. I mean, and I think it's tragic i think it's horrible and if it was happening to any other group uh it would be a cause for outrage but because you know white males are privilege my ass right <laughs> privileges to be blamed for everything and i guess who'd like us just looking today this is completely by the by zach but it's just looking today that there are like well north of 45 million slaves in the world today and the top five Nations where slavery exists and slaves are bought and sold are all non-white nations. Right. And they have a list, oh, here where there's no slavery or very few slavery, boom, boom, boom. It's all, you know, historically white nations, less so, of course, as time goes along. And so the least slave-owning nations are the historically white nations. The most slaving own, uh, slave-owning nations are the non-white countries, but who gets blamed for slavery? Ding, ding, ding. Yes, that would be a uh, space decent. So uh, it is, uh, it is tragic. Uh, it is tragic. Right, right. Now, of and course, you do need, you need the degree, uh, you need the accreditation, you need the formal structure to right. become a patent lawyer. Um, but it's going to be a price to pay for that, right? Right, right. I mean, your There's, relationship to university, I mean, it, it's traumatic now, right? I knew I was walking into enemy territory from the very beginning, Stefan. Um, it was not something I, I relished, but I knew it was more or less a means to an end. Um, so what actually drove me towards uh, the Greek life community, the fraternities, was the fact that out of any sort of corner on campus, any group of student organizations, they were the most... Uh, the, the most conservative or, or classically liberal in uh, in that sense. They were the people who cared a lot about free speech. If you, if they cared about capitalism, they cared about the things like these classical Western sure. values. Sure, that's another reason so why white males are targeted is white males are the largest constituents for a small government in the world. And so if you want a bigger government, they your natural prey. Right, so I... I I was very much drawn to uh, this fraternity in particular because of that sort of openness, that sort of willingness to discuss things rather than shutting down people we don't like. 
And that was that was a disagreement with my parents. A lot of it was they were like, why would you put yourself under, you know, why would you put yourself under the crosshairs? Essentially, you're walking to where they expect you will be. Um, but for me, it was it was more of I, I could thrive better. I could learn better when I had those resources, that network and was around people um, that supported the same ideas that I did. Right. Now. Your ambition prior to being targeted in this kind of way, Zach, your ambition was to work as a patent lawyer. Correct. Has this experience, I mean, I don't know, put words in your mouth, but has this experience potentially changed where you think your focus may be as a person who cares about freedom? I think it has um, in that... I don't trust uh, I don't trust fellow students to hold to those values on a campus setting where someone could potentially put a gun to their head and tell them unless you unless you um, play Judas against this guy, uh, we're going to do awful things to you. And, and they did threaten a lot of my fraternity brothers um, basically say talk or we'll do awful things to you. There was one of my fraternity brothers who even said that uh, the investigator guy, told him that he would make sure he had trouble feeding his family one day unless he told him what he wanted to hear. Good Lord. Man alive. I mean, th this is the environment that is often where you are. Right. This totalitarian, no rules, veiled threats, foggy consequences, turn on each other, betray your values knuckle down right you don't like to have an effect in the world you don't need to go to college to have a Agreed. positive effect for freedom you don't need to go to college Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm not just saying this to you this is just in general there's a whole like the gatekeepers are gone college used to be a way of course that you would go and say hey i'm one of the smart guys you know, right. I, I can plan things, I can get into college, I can complete my assignments, I can navigate the system, I can come out with a degree, I know A, B, C, X, Y, and Z. Right. That is not what college is anymore. I mean, with some few exceptions in various faculties, that is not. Of course. Right. And my parents basically are of the same impression. They told me, don't go to college unless you know that you need to go to college. And that was what drove a lot of uh, my efforts in high school uh, as far as getting the scholarships I've gotten, everything else, because I knew this is something I need. This is something for no, what but, I want mm, to do. But Zach, what if you end up going through college, keeping your head down, feeling like you're in some mental North Korean labor camp intellectually and, and fearing you know, every phone call and every complaint that could exist or fearing people find out your history or what happened. And then you end up articling, studying the bar, getting your degree, and you find that the law is not what you thought it was. You find out that the law is kind of what you faced in the past and what you're facing tomorrow. Right. Well, I have other motivations um, besides just patent law for wanting to go to law school specifically. Um, and that is specifically that it seems from my experience, from the people I've talked to, um, that law school is one of the few uh, few areas in the education field where it's actually like a boot camp for your brain. They actually teach uh, logic. They actually teach um, how to think better. Um, and that's what I want for myself. But you've and heard the I'm, Dershowitz stuff, right? I mean, of course, of course. That, well, why don't you, why don't you say it? Uh, specifically what? Well, him talking, uh, his his issues teaching rape law. Right, right. Well, I mean, it's the inconsistency between uh, moral laws or ethics and the current laws we live in. Oh, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> let me, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Let me just look this up, make sure I get it correct. Let me make sure I get this correct. So, um, 
Dershowitz, Alan Dershowitz, a famous lawyer, of course, uh, was when he, he was teaching rape law, he got complaints uh, from from students, and now he has to record everything. And he was, you know, they considered him teaching rape law to be problematic. Right. And that is where things are. <laughs> even in even in a famous law school, even with a famous lawyer. I mean, I've I've had conversations with academics uh, where it is a very alarming environment, and you've got a whole bunch of you know we we see this uh, the president of the United States is supposed to have significant, if not complete, control over immigration policies. And you've got all these activist judges saying, nope, can't do it. And so right. where you go in terms of the law may not be in some ways foundationally different from what you've been exposed to at the college. Well, if that is the case, <laughs> that's not the road I want to go down, of course. I don't yeah. want to change my values in given my environment. Uh, I've been supplementing uh, lectures at my university with a healthy dose of, say, your program or, or other philosophy programs, other political programs like Steven Crowder's program, um, just as, as a break from the madness in order to give me the alternate perspective and sort of bring me down to earth, uh, breaking through the bubble, I call it. Right. Right. Here we go. The trouble with teaching rape law. Imagine a medical system from the New Yorker. Imagine a medical student who is training to be a surgeon, but who fears that he'll become distressed if he sees or handles blood. What should his instructors do? Criminal law teachers face a similar question with law students who are afraid to study rape law. And... Um, they say 30 years ago, their reluctance would not have posed a problem until the mid-1980s. Rape law was not taught in law schools because it wasn't considered important or suited to the rational pedagogy of law school classrooms. And he says, uh, but my experience, as this woman says, but my experience at Harvard over the past couple of years tells me that the environment for teaching rape law and other subjects involving gender and violence is changing. Students seem more anxious about classroom discussion and about approaching the law of sexual violence in particular than they have been ever been in my eight years as a law professor. Student organizations representing women's interests now routinely advise students that they should not feel pressured to attend or participate in class sessions that focus on the law of sexual violence and which might therefore be traumatic. Hmm. These organizations also ask criminal law teachers to warn their classes that the rape law unit might trigger traumatic memories. Individual students often ask teachers not to include the law of rape on exams for fear that the material would cause them to perform less well. Wow. One teacher I know was recently asked by a student not to use the word violate in class, as in, does this conduct violate the law? Because the word was triggering. Some students have even suggested the rape law should not be taught because of its potential to cause distress. <laughs> I don't know that it's exactly to kill a mockingbird in there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree with you. From my experience, uh, the social justice warriors have taken over uh, big swaths of the campus. Now, to my uh, amazement, at least in my own university, uh, the, the sciences and the economics departments, uh, the more pure fields in my mind, have uh, been able to ward off this sort of uh, vague and or destructive thought. Um, they've been able to combat it with reason or they just stay out of the, the political issues or, or I don't want to use that uh, word or they want to, they want to stay out of these um, sort of um, emotional issues. The science like chemistry is chemistry and there's very little that can influence chemistry um, from outside sources. There's no political agendas. There's no wait. Are you uh, saying there's no political agendas in science? Oh, absolutely in science, but I would say like in mathematics, there's really not. Uh, in chemistry, um, there are, I'd say, some small issues, but um, in large, uh, it's not really a controversial topic. Uh, and biology is probably the most controversial, that or psychology, that I've observed. Well, you know, if, if, uh, if mathematics was so free... Why aren't they spending more time cracking open some of the fudgy data in global warming? I mean, they would be the experts to do it, but they don't seem to want to do it. 
because right. why? Because That's I mean, good lord, you know how many scientific disputes these days are settled by being sued? Yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, good lord. I mean, the idea that that you settle scientific disputes in the courtroom. <laughs> I mean, what is this, the monkey scopes trial, which itself was largely bullshit? Science right. is incredibly politicized because it's government funded. And uh, as you know, biology, like race and IQ, is a highly volatile subject. Race and criminality, a highly volatile subject. Uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's areas where it's not, but uh, it's pretty politicized from what I can tell. What I can say is that what I've observed just from my classroom settings, uh, from my professors, is there is not a lot. There's there's some global warming stuff that comes up every once in a while, but that's not by any means a focus. They're not basing curriculums on that. Um, there are no courses on it yet. There, It's very much just, okay, we're going to teach you organic chemistry. We're going to teach you the same organic chemistry that uh, the ACS requires from so many re universities, right? It, it's really not... Um, Controversial in that me. I haven't encountered many uh, really controversial issues within right. that field. What is it about patent law that satisfies your ambition or intellect that you feel you could not get out of being an entrepreneur? Well, actually, entrepreneurship was was another thing um, on my radar as well. Um, I think law school, at least, even if the laws aren't fair. Uh, even if the laws aren't moral or ethical, knowing what the laws are can help you become an entrepreneur um, as far as just knowing how to uh, negotiate this madness. Oh, come on, uh, man. Zach, I mean, if you're going to spend years becoming a lawyer and spend how much to become a lawyer, the idea that you couldn't spend that money in those years becoming an entrepreneur and be better off, I think, is not very rational. Well, the thing was, it was going to be almost free with, with the scholarship I had. And now yeah, I've but got you know it. the concept of opportunity costs, right? True, true. So that's my question. What is it in college that you feel you need that you can't get from being an entrepreneur? Or let me put it another way. Do you know the educational achievements down to the last detail of the people you listen to and who influence you? Absolutely not. No, I don't. I, I, I don't know what Stephen Crowder's educational achievement, ach achievements are. I have no idea. Right. It, does it right. matter? Well, if you're going into, say, if I wanted to go specifically into patent law. No, no, no. Um, I know that. What I'm saying right. is that if you wanted to be an entrepreneur and if you wanted to do good in the world, and if you wanted to spread virtue and, and critical thinking and, and knowledge and philosophy and so on, well, college would be the wrong place to go, <laughs> I think completely the wrong place to go. Well, the long term, I don't, I don't know exactly what I want to do with my life, I got to be honest with you. But one thing that really kept popping in my head was uh, there are several pharmaceutical companies. Um, who are interested in lobbying uh, specifically against the FDA, trying to reduce federal regulations, trying to strip through some of this madness, um, where, where they're, you know, they're, they're drugs that have been legal in Europe that are effective, they've been proven to be effective, but they're not legal here because they still have to jump through all of their hoops and cut all the red tape. Um, so which, is, what, which has cost literally millions of American lives, just so. And you know, people can uh, look at Dr. Mary Ruart, R-U-W-A-R-T, for, for more on that. But sorry, go ahead. So one interest of mine was specifically to go into, say, politics on the local level, state politics. We've got a couple of very big uh, pharmaceutical companies headquartered here where I live in Indiana, um, or uh, to become a lobbyist of sorts. Um, and these positions exist. There are people who do this. And to be able to fight the FDA machine. Um, personally, I, like my little brother, uh, he, was, he was paralyzed when he was three months old from the waist down. He's had cancer. He's got scoliosis. He's got Down syndrome, all sorts of medical issues, which, in my opinion, uh, many of which could be averted with a little bit more freedom. So if you and I'm sorry to hear about your your brother, my huge sympathy to to you and your entire family for for those challenges. But if you want to make the case for reducing regulations, why do you need to be a lawyer? Well, you and I really don't care too much about credentials, but a lot of the, the leftist community does, in, in my view at least, what I've observed. Um, they 
like people who use the big words, who speak their own language, who have the credentials, who are basically on their level or whatever level it is in their own heads. They want to feel as though they're talking to another academic, even though I think it's, no, it's but all why, just, Sorry, first of all, the fact that the left likes it should be your first <laughs> warning, right? But I don't, secondly, uh, just, why would you want to talk to the leftists? You, 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 can't, you can't change their minds for the most part any more than they can change your minds about sort of fundamental issues. You know, this is the RK stuff. I mean, it's some somewhere at the level right. of genetics. Politics is to some degree at the level of genetics. They can predict uh, people's political affiliations, or at least they can map them um, according to genes. So you're trying to talk someone out of being tall or short uh, in terms right. of using language. The way that you would change this stuff, I think, is you would bring your message to millions of people as charismatically, as entertainingly, as engagingly as possible, and through that, you would develop the pressure to change the situation. But the yeah. idea that, well, they'll listen to me because I'm a lawyer, I mean, no, 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 no. That, they won't, it's right? I mean, tr Trump is very well educated. They, they sure as hell don't. He's not able to change their minds, right? It's more so for the, the people who are sort of on, on the fence about these issues. You, you had a video, it was a call-in show, I forget when it was. Um, where you're talking about uh, the proper way to argue and you had a guest who was kind of hostile towards you about um, being mean in an argument. Um, it's it's not always to win over the, the guys across the fence. It's often to win the guys who are on the fence, who might respect the credentials, who might see that you're talking the same language, beating them at their own game, as it were. That's that's my sort of uh, take on this. And I'm not saying it, it's perfect. I've, I've honestly not put... Do you, think, do you think that I should have delayed starting my show for seven years so I could go to Harvard and get a PhD in philosophy? Absolutely not. Why, why not? I would have credentials. Your audience is, is composed of all sorts of, of people, not specifically pe other people with uh, law degrees or philosophy degrees. And m my opinion, I guess, on this, or I don't want to call it an opinion, my argument would be that in order to debate lawyers, they would respect you more if you're a lawyer. Okay, so if you want to spend your life debating leftist lawyers, I'm not really sure that there's much I could say. I mean, I would question as to whether or not that's the most effective way to spend your life. Because remember, being a lawyer means you have a license, and being a licensed means that you're vulnerable, right? Because people can always just try and attack your license. That's true. That's true. Right. Well, to be honest, I, I don't want to sound like I'm hard set. I'm, I'm throwing uh, arguments at you that I've, I've tossed around in my own head. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with the next year or the next seven years of my life. Um, well, if you listen, I, I mean, I hope that you get what you want tomorrow. I hope you get justice tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I hope you let us know how it goes. But I will say this, like if you, if you do get a year off, you do have the opportunity to pursue entrepreneurial stuff in the realm of passionate advocacy for freedom, right? right. Because there right. is very, uh, there's no barrier to entry. If, if you've got, you know, the technology to make a phone call through to me, then you have the technology to do what I do, right? I mean, so you have the opportunity to make a passionate case for freedom over the next year, and maybe you can make some money uh, doing so, or you Patreon, or, or how you ask for donations, or whatever it is, come out with cool ideas for merchandise, and so on. So you do have the opportunity to do that, in which case, you know, um, I offer you the possibility, this is why I said at the beginning, Zach, that I'm ambivalent about it, because let's say you throw yourself heart and soul into passionately communicating for freedom and you get subtraction and you take off and you find out that you love it and you know what you'll say about the hearing tomorrow if it doesn't go the way you want it to doesn't matter not only doesn't matter best thing that happened right that's, best. That's I, I, I had a list and i won't go through it now in the interest of time i have a list of the things i thought were bad at the time that turned out to be great <laughs> And that list is pretty much everything, everything I thought was bad at the time turned out to be, uh, to be great. Right. Right. No, I, 
I really appreciate uh, that input. You know, I've, I've thought about different things entrepreneurially I could do, but I've never thought about, say, what you suggested, um, voicing my opinion in a similar way to what you do or other YouTubers or whatever it may be. I've never thought about doing that myself. Do it, man. You are intelligent, articulate, uh, articulate. you're a clear thinker, you, you're a persuasive uh, debater, or conversationalist just based upon our back and forth here, and you're very passionate about freedom to the point where you are willing to risk your academic future and go against the advice of your parents by joining a frat just because they were freedom lovers like yourself. Maybe that's God's way of saying, put freedom above indoctrination. Put freedom above college. Put effectiveness above accreditation. Maybe the universe, for want of a better word, is trying to tell you something, that you chose freedom over safety. And I think that your desire for accreditation may have something to do with safety. The only people I could convince on the power of accreditation would be people who aren't worth convincing. Like, I'm either going to make good arguments or I'm not. My arguments are either valid or they're invalid. Me having a PhD in philosophy from XYZ indoctrination camp doesn't make my arguments any better or any worse. Anyone who says, well, I'm going to listen to this guy because he's got a PhD from ha, what they're saying is I can't think for myself, so I'm going to kneel before the medieval god of calligraphy. <laughs> you know, like I always have these things on the wall, you know, all these ornate swirly letters that look like drunken spiders lurching across parchment. I mean, I... I Tom Willicott, years ago, I did a debate with Tom Willicott. I think if I remember right, he had two PhDs and he was a lawyer and he was terrible. Wow. <laughs> All right, go listen to the debate. Go I'll look it up. Yeah. Listen to the debate. And I don't want anyone, like, I, I, if I could snap my fingers and magically have a PhD from some, in, in philosophy, I would not want it. I would say no to that. Because not having the accreditation, like not having a doctorate in philosophy, but running the world's biggest philosophy show, <laughs> means that I have to work harder. That's why I don't have Kevin Federline in his belly as a backup dancer. <laughs> Just this plain white background. Right. A white spotty foreground. Because I have to work harder. I have to work harder. If I had the accreditation, I could coast a little more. And I could, and, and people could say to me, well, you should listen to Steph because he's got a PhD from Halala, right? It's like, no, I don't want anyone to listen to me because I have a, a degree in whatever. No, that's fair. That's it's persuasive argument, and you sold me on it, man. I have to work harder. You'll be a better presenter without accreditation. The degree to which you need the accreditation is the degree to which you feel insecure and you're wallpapering over the insecurity with the accreditation. But no, you have to confront that insecurity. I have to sit there and say, yep, yeah, I'm going to debate a guy with a PhD in philosophy and a law degree, <laughs> right? And I have to debate um, foreign trade with a former budget director under Reagan or whatever, right? I mean, and that just means that I have to work harder. I have to polish my arguments more. I have to be better. And so for me, I've, me I've mentioned this story before, but it's been a while, so we'll consider it new, you know, just like we're married and I'm pretending the new story is new. I read the story many, many years ago. Very briefly, a guy was a butler, and one day he's dressing his lord, and his lord asks him to read something, and the guy says, I can't read it. He says, why not? Because I can't read, right? Mm -hmm. So he gets fired, and he's really up despondent, and he goes down the street, and he wants a smoke, but he can't find a smoke shop on the whole street. So he ends up saying, well, other people must want a smoke shop, so he opens a smoke shop, and then he opens up another one, and then he opens up a department store, and then he opens up a mall, and then blah, 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 right? Right. And then, you know, 10 years later, he's a multimillionaire. And he goes to his accountant, and his accountant says, I need you to read this. Guy says, I can't. <laughs> he says, why not? Because <laughs> I can't read. Hmm. <laughs> And he wow. says, you, wait, you've become a multimillionaire, incredibly successful businessman, and you can't even read? Imagine where you'd be if you could read. And the guy says, I know exactly where I'd be if I could read. I'd be this guy's butler. Wow. Yeah. 
No, that's that's a powerful story. Yeah, no, I you know I definitely- fat chicks. <laughs> you know the, the the cliche about fat chicks, right? You know when people say, "Hey, man, I want you, Zach. I got a great blind date for you." She's got a really, really great personality. She's really funny. What do you think? <laughs> oh, probably lacking in the uh, uh, the aesthetic department. Yeah, you have to make up for your deficiencies. You have to overcompensate or at least compensate for your deficiencies. I work so hard because partly, in fact, because I don't have some big fancy schmancy background. I don't have a PhD in philosophy, so I have to work harder. I have to have a great personality. <laughs> because I don't have the cleavage of the PhD. So deficiency is quality. That's kind of what I'm pointing out. Full deficiency in, say, the the degrees, the the things I might be seeking. Yeah. What if you had to make the case to somebody and could not rest upon your credentials? What if you had to go talk to a lawyer about the FDA and you could not rest on your credentials? What would you do? You'd work damn well harder, right? Well, I, in personal experience, I got to say the same thing right now. I, I crafted this elaborate email with lots of research I did on, say, federal precedent on free speech on public campuses. Um, and I, I sent it to the dean uh, last night, hoping that he might, because he still has the power to dismiss the case, uh, hoping that he might see a reason and, and drop the whole thing. And then I got a response that was just like, hey, thanks for your email. The hearing is still tomorrow. But it was still it was empowering to think that I could do all that research and um, basically do the work of a lawyer without being a lawyer. Yeah, I mean, law is supposed to be rational argument based on precedent. Right. I don't see where you <laughs> where where you have to be a lawyer to make a rational argument. So anyway, these if you have the year, I would say engage as much as possible in a public sphere and see what you can make of that year in sharpening your skills of presentation, of debate, of argument, of motivation, of rousing the masses to the diminishments of their freedoms and hopefully helping turn all of this around. That would be a pretty cool way. And if that should happen to pan out, and, and I think it it well could. I mean, that that is largely up to you. How courageous are you willing to be? How many risks are you willing to take? How personable and vulnerable are you willing to be, right? I mean, to really go out into the world and say you care about stuff is put a giant series of disco lasers on your forehead from all of the nihilistic snipers that surround every potential flaring and flourishing of human um, hope. And so that's up to you. How successful you're going to be is largely up to you in this realm. And if you were to take whatever happens tomorrow, let's say you get the time, let's say you get the summer, and you were to go full till boogie, hit the gas, Mach 12, in bringing great arguments to the public sphere, mm, what if you loved it? And you look back and say, I am so glad they went nuts because that's how I got sane. Right. Right, but, but that's kind of wow, big picture, eye-opening sort of thing to think about. I had um, let me give you a stupid example. This is bullshit, but I'll say it anyway. So uh, a couple of years ago, I got a little pocket in my gum, which is where I don't know something burrowed in and made a home there and laid spider eggs or whatever, right? Oh, uh, what? <laughs> that sounds like pretty passionate from you. <laughs> Have you had something yeah, like that? Uh, those are the sort of things that keep me up at night, man. Yeah, so, and, and it's not bad, you know, I, I kept it clean and all that, but, you know, it, it didn't hurt, it wasn't getting any better, it wasn't really getting any worse. And then I'm like, you know, fuck it, I'm just cutting out sugar. Now, I was not a huge sugar hound, it's just something you kind of have to give up as you get older, but I was like, that's it, no more sugar. And it's better all around. I still miss it a bit, <laughs> but overall, I mean, this is all getting better and, and, I have uh, have more energy, a better digestion, like the whole thing is like, so I'm like, oh, no, I have a little pocket in my gum, you know, it's like, oh, no, this is bad. It's like, no, this was fantastic. Because it prompted me to make a change that I'm never going back on. So hard to tell what is good and what is bad. 
I'm telling you, it's really, really hard to tell. I mean, me, I'm a, I'm a 21 year old guy. Like I've got barely any life experience under my wing and facing the world, you know, freshly, I would say three years, still freshly out of my parents' house. Um, not having them to, to sort of uh, baby step me through. Oh man, I know. And I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Zach. You don't have yes, experience in the world. Are you kidding me? What you just went through, what you're going through. Well, I didn't have experience with this sort of thing before. So I'm saying, I'm saying this whole experience you have was it now. Right. And you right. have an experience of a visceral injustice within the system that makes you tragically or positively wise beyond your years, right? I suppose so. Use it. What, what, what can we do? You know, the old judo, use the momentum of your attacker to make him lose. One of the reasons I called or I, I emailed in and said I wanted to be on your show is because I think the story like mine can't go untold. And that's not just for selfish or personal reasons. That's because I know if they can do it to me, they can do it to any other schmuck who says something they don't like. They can take any speech, twist it under some obscure policy and under some obscure definition and punish that person for it. And I mean, I wanted to get on your show. I try to get, um, try to get in contact with Steven Crowder and those guys as well. Um, but I, I'm, it's absolutely a thrill to be on here and just be able to share the story with a wider audience than uh, I've had. Well, and I think you've done a, a really great job. I, again, I say I'm ambivalent about what happened to you. I hate the injustice, uh, and I respect the opportunity that it might provide you for a life that is more self-directed and self-generated and less sitting in the train tracks that were installed by a society before you that treated your generation abominably badly. So I, um, I remain ambivalent about it. I mean, certainly, please, if you can, let us know what happens after tomorrow. And um, I hope that you will not look at it as, oh, like this is the worst thing ever, which I can completely understand. You know, when you think you're going in a particular direction and your direction is rudely altered, right. then that is, that is a shock to the system. But this is, you know, I don't want to give you the, the boring ass builds character speech, but there is significant opportunity in being pushed off the tracks because you had a track. Well, I'm going to go this, I'm going to do chemistry, I'm going to do my pre-law, I'm going to do my law degree, I'm going to do this. That was your track. You pushed off the tracks. Now you get to explore, you get to carve your own path, you get to pursue your own values outside of an externally imposed agenda. That is alarming. And if you can pull it off, unbelievably liberating both for you and the world as a whole. Well, I look forward to what lies ahead, no matter what it be. Um, we never got to the, the more philosophical question that I asked, but hey, perhaps another time. I know we're out of time today. You are absolutely welcome back, and uh, let us know how it goes, man. Thanks so much for your story. Thank you so much for your time, Stefan. All right, man. If you can avoid – you know, college is like the ER. You know, if, if, you, if, you, if there's any way you're not there – don't be there. <laughs> if there's any way you cannot be in the ER, don't be in the R. And I think the same is true, particularly with arts degrees these days. But uh, all right, let's move on to the next caller.